they're, they're proximate enough to us that they feel close, but they're distant enough that they got the kind of education we're trying to say this is those are this kind of education breeds those kinds of people. Welcome to Classical Etc. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Welcome to another episode of Classical Etc. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about a few of our favorite heroes. Well, mine and Martin's found out that Paul <laughs> has already decided to... Honestly, both of you this morning to start have been just difficult to deal with, if I could bring the audience in on that. So that's the episode we're about to have, is a difficult one with Paul and Martin. And I think that's probably because Tanya's not here. She tends to... That should make it easier. Balance things out. <laughs> uh, be more pleasant. But before we I'm get into the mouth shut about all of that, <laughs> okay, we're we're gonna try not to be difficult. <laughs> Paul, I have to ask you, what have you been reading recently? I just finished the Tenth Man. I said I was gonna read that mm-hmm. uh, in the last podcast, and I didn't read it. Is this by our our podcast honorary author Sabatini? No, no, this is by <laughs> Graham Greene. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, the, actually, Sabatini's. I got I got a little stack next to my bed. And I've got the Romantic Prince, so that's that's nice. coming up by Sabatini. Nice, um, but I the the this one, the Tenth Man by Graham Greene, is it's just phenomenal. It's such an easy read, but it's it's so deep. It's you know, it's a story of a man who uh, gets chosen to be killed in a concentration camp, and offers all of his money to somebody to take his place and somebody takes him up on the offer. And in, I think it's, I think there was like part one and part two, three, four, all him trying to deal with what it means to be, I mean, he, he deals with it on multiple fronts. Like he was a lawyer, but because he's got no money, like nobody will hire him because he's got no like hireable skills um, because he can't run his own firm because he doesn't have the money to do it. And then there's the whole, the the whole spiritual element of like, who is he that he, you know, with money paid for somebody else to die. Uh, And so you kind of have all of that, the idea of home, he's given away his home in order to save his life. So there's a whole lot of different fronts that, that he's struggling with and kind of, can he, can he be redeemed after doing something like that? Hmm. Sounds, sounds like it. It sounds to me like Graham Greene in some ways is a classic example of novelists always write the same novel. You know, no novelist has written more than one novel. Yes, but he, but Graham Greene always has a, has twists in his novels and I feel like they're always unseen. Mm-hmm. You don't always see them coming. Yeah. And, and this one, this one at towards the end, I was like, whoa, didn't see that coming, but adds a whole different element to uh, that I, th- I think Graham Greene plays a lot with Providence. Like, you know, it's not a deus ex machina, but it's really like in our lives, things happen that are totally unexpected, mm-hmm. but often work for um, our good. Yeah. Martin, what about you? What have you been reading? I just started a new book yesterday. <clears throat> Actually, I'm, I'm still trying to finish Three Musketeers. <clears throat> that should be your priority. <laughs> um, it, uh, I was in... Um, the Netherlands uh, for a conference I was speaking at uh, in uh, near Utrecht, um, Netherlands, and there was a book I found there. In fact, this this the author was there. Nigel Bigger mm. is his name. He's a British. Um, I, I think his training is actually as a theologian, but but he he's he's written a book called Colonialism, and this book is trying to treat you know we're we're all now uh, supposed to hate everything uh, imperialistic and colonial and and uh it was it was all bad it was all evil it was all wicked and and all the the uh, native people were angels and and he says look, look we just need to to balance this here it's a very fair very intelligent very um uh wise take on on our history in the west of uh, of colonialism and pointing out that most of the things that we accuse ourselves of now were also done by everybody else uh, outside of the West. And uh, what are the things in the West that are redeeming? And um, and so it's just a, a book with really good judgment 
um, very well written. I had never heard of Nigel Bigger before, but I was, um, I'll read anything else. He, he was one of, those, one of those authors you read a book and you think, I want to read everything else this guy wrote. So that's what I mean. So it's a book that defends people who conquered other people. <clears throat> Pardon? It's a book that defends people who conquered it, and killed other people. It's a book that defends people who who conquered who who conquered other people who conquered other people who conquered other people. Does that uh, make the conquering right? Uh, no, but he's he's basically saying that um, uh, that uh, number one, colonialism is not the same thing as imperialism. There's there are really two different things. Uh, that history is complicated. And that nobody's totally there's not people in the in in the white suits and the people in the black suits. It's it's this that's not the way history is. And we have things we need to be uh, uh, things we need to regret. And then we have things that we don't need to regret that people are accusing us of. Uh, so he's just trying to parse those things out. Now you know the world is full of good and evil. The conflict between good and evil. And there's no place where there's all good. And there's no place where there's all evil. No. <clears throat> so I've recently been reading The City of God, the Chivitas Dei, I believe, mm -hmm. is the Latin title, right? Um, in English. De Chivitate Dei would be what it Thank has you. to be for the ablative case. Yes. That's helpful. That's a helpful note. Uh, I'm, in book, <laughs> I'm in book five, I believe. And, you know, it's an 1100 page book. So there's quite a bit to it. But I think the biggest thing that I've taken away in these first five books is how little you will be able to glean from the book if you don't have a basic grasp of Roman history, because mm. he is so uh, full of, his mind is full of Roman stories, legends, myth, and religious you know, ideas. And the current book I'm reading is where he goes through every Roman God and he's like, you know, you Romans have a God for a door and a door hinge, which means that your God of the door hinge isn't able to move the door. So what kind of God is that? And, and he just goes through every, every Roman God. But in doing that, he also is telling these stories of Regulus and Scipio and all of the different stories. And if you, and he doesn't explain them. So if you don't know a bit, and so thankfully I've taught famous men of Rome and book of the ancient Romans <laughs> or else I wouldn't have been able to engage it. So it's been a kind of an encourage, a reminder of like, this is classically educated people are able to read books that have a classical origin for a reason because these stories build on themselves. And then I also finished Angle of Repose by Wallace Stegner this morning, um, which ends with an absolutely ludicrous dream oh, sequence. Uh, is this a spoiler? No spoiler. Okay. It ends with a ludicrous dream sequence. And it just really caught me off guard and was awesome. And I really <laughs> enjoyed the book. So you, you recommend this book? Highly recommend it. It's his Pulitzer. Um, I, I think I probably enjoyed his other two more in terms of just there were there was more the his writing is so quippy and funny and literary um, and his characters are great and the other two are easier but Angle of Repose is it is more it it, it demanded more of me so I maybe didn't mm. enjoy it as much but I I respected it more mm. um, and I'm I'm on to Spectator Bird next <clears throat> have you have you guys read Neil Wallace Stegner? Uh yeah, no. I think you asked this last time. I think uh, I, I read Big Rock Candy Mountain, nice, which was very good. Yeah, I have not read any, but you're you're making me give it great consideration. I, yeah, I think you'd like him. I love this point you just made, though. But the, the, like, when something demands more of you, you respect it more. Yeah, I think that's something we need to kind of hold up, right? Well, and also I, back to your point on <clears throat> City of God, that um, it, it's another argument that. Uh, before you read the hundred great books, you need mm. to read the thousand good books. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, you, you need preparation to read the great books, and I think this is probably a lot of our audience, uh, uh, particularly homeschooling mothers, who are <clears throat> looking at this program and saying that later on we read all these these great things. And how am I going to do that? Well, you're going to you're going to do that by doing the rest of the program and really preparing yourself. That's what the that's what the program's for. I would say that. I, I had never realized how significant it was that we have our students read Cicero before. You know, it's like we have a master plan <laughs> that's really well put together. Because it didn't seem that way when we were putting it together. Augustine is so heavily reliant on the Republic and the laws and on obligations. And for me, I think my the first time I really started to understand Roman history is when I was reading Cicero, those two books specifically, and really trying to wrestle with what he was doing. And in order to do so, you have to like get into these stories and figure out what stories he's telling. And that has helped me a lot as I've read Augustine. And we read those in one year, you know, that that's mm -hmm. what our students do is they start with Cicero, then go to Augustine, which now that makes perfect sense. 
Yeah. The more you know, the more you are able to learn. Mm. So let's turn to our topic. One of our favorite conversation partners in classical education is C.S. Lewis, another G.K. Chesterton. But it, it just historically speaking, neither of them were in the classical education as we know it movement as we know it today because it started in the 80s, right? However, Lewis may be closer to Chesterton because he wrote Abolition of Man, which, is, which was specifically critical of modern education. People in classical education adopt these two figures, especially as their own. Is that legitimate? Do you think that Chesterton or Lewis, if they were here today, they would be proponents of Highlands Latin School and Memorial Press? Martin? I think Highlands Latin School would be the only school that they could understand. Hmm. I mean, because you, know, you said that the classical education movement didn't start until the 1980s. Well, classical education was around a whole lot earlier than that. Uh, and they went to schools where they did the kinds of things that we do. Um, we're resurrecting something. I think we need to remember that we're not, we didn't just create something in the 1980s from Dorothy Sayers, three stages. Um, this is a tradition that goes, uh, <clears throat> all the way back to ancient times in different forms. And so I think that, um, Lewis would have thought, I mean, I, I, I understand that, that abolition of man is a critique of modern education, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a critique of, it's not the kind of critique he would make if he were writing it today um, because the problems are different. But he you know, it really, uh, uh, and anyone going to school when he went to school, certainly when Chester was going to school, got what we would call a classical education. That's the only kind of education that existed there. It was, you know, progressivism was just coming in. I think, I don't think that's something Lewis would have I don't think those schools were around when Lewis was being educated when he was a child. That progressivism is a very recent 20th century thing. So I think they would very much understand what we were doing and wouldn't be able to understand the, uh, some of the other things that were going on. Although some of the things that Lewis criticized were, we see in our schools today. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's important to point out that as, as much as, we would say like what Martin was pointing out with our, with the kind of education we're given is the kind of education they had, but there was a whole lot more uniformity in what the culture was passing down. Right. So even though they, they don't explicitly say I'm a proponent of classical education, they're a proponent of the tradition. And that tradition is what, as Martin says, we're trying to resurrect. Like that's what we're hearkening back to is to say, at some point we have this all figured out. Now we feel like we're all in this, this, you know, whirlpool of despair when it comes to education. But that's because we lost sight of what the tradition had been handing down. And so, yeah, there, I would say we can 100% appropriate them because they're part of the tradition that we're hearkening back to. Fully, 100%. And, and, and really, they're living in a time when, um, when, and really kind of in the wake of, you know, the treason of the clerks in the 19th century, when the intellectuals abandoned Christianity and, and started really interrogating the Western tradition. But there's still so much of it. That's in the intellectual classes, and that filters down. But still, the schools they would have been going to would have been pretty traditional. And they would have been doing what class they, their schools would have would have consciously had the purpose of what we say is the purpose of classical education which is to pass on your civilization that's what schools still did at that time um, and so I think uh, I think they would look at what we're doing and see it as fairly similar to hey Shane here, popping in to say thank you for joining us on this episode. If you don't know already, we have a ton of great resources at memoriapress.com that provide great insights for homeschoolers and traditional schoolers alike. Check that out when you can. Thanks for being here. Now let's jump back in. So I, th I think what you're talking about gets right at, at my question, and that is if everyone, you know, if Lewis is being educated in the, you know, or he's at Oxford in the early 20s and, you know, late teens, he's being educated, then and everyone's getting this classical education then. 
why do these two stand out to us today, especially in our movement? Why are there Chesterton Academies and every classical school has a Lewis quote on their website if everyone was getting this education? What made them unique and why do we see them as supporters of what we're doing today? Well, I, I think um, they were they were defending a tradition that they saw was was in danger. Um, we're just further down the line from that. I mean, I mean, Europe goes through all these things about sixty to eighty years before we do. the 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 progress of secularism um, is is much more advanced there than it is here. So we can kind of look back on what happened there and and learn from it. Um, there's a great book. Uh, I, I one of my favorite intellectual books. It's called God's Funeral. Um, by A. N. Wilson, and it is about what happened in England and in uh, in somewhat in Europe when the intellectual classes um, began to reject Christianity and traditional, really, uh, God, and and then he draws the consequences from that. It's a really well written book, and he t- he tells the story of how this happens. And again, that happens there a whole lot earlier than it happens here. So we need to look to to Europe to see what are the consequences of that because they're more advanced there, and that's what we're going to be like uh, in the future. And I'm sorry, I forgot what your question. Well, was. his his question was because <laughs> I was going to get back to this was like why why does the classical movement really hold on to these two? Everybody's got you know schools named after them or quotes from on their website. Mm-hmm. And I think because they're, they're it, doing what we should, what we're, we need to do now. Yeah. And, and they're sort of the most proximate to us that, uh, uh, that were vocal defenders of the, the, the vision of reality that we espouse as classical educators, right? The, the idea of objective truth, objective goodness, objective beauty, the idea of a morality that's unchanging, all of those values, right? Which is what the West is trying to pass down. And that's, that's what, classical education. So a large part of what classical education is about those, those two Lewis and Chesterton are, are um, they're, they're proximate enough to us that they feel close, but they're distant enough that they got the kind of education. We're trying to say, this is, those are, this kind of education breeds those kinds of people. And, and so that's why I think we, we really uh, look at them as the uh, heroes. I think we used that word earlier. Uh, that we need to um, kind of keep our eyes on because if, if, if a classical school could, could produce, I hate using that term of, and, and the, it could form uh, a child like Lewis or Chesterton once every generation, we'd be doing pretty well as a society. So you were stating it both kind of in the negative of like, they were defending the tradition. That is that they were, uh, articulating against what are in the positive sense what what values in the tradition were they articulating and and why do those resonate with us today well i mean we we did a show and we're starting to do shows on the the true the good and the beautiful i mean you could go back and if you <clears throat> could pick up a copy of the abolition of man uh, one of his arguments in there is that there is this general background ethos that all cultures to some extent bow to because we are human beings and we have a a human nature and that is universal with human beings. And so you see that working itself out uh, in all cultures, even though they don't have a a revelation of, of, of the truth like Christianity has, they're still made in God's image and they still seek certain things. And, Lewis calls that the Tao, um, and he delineates those the different ethical aspects of that, and how that how that works out in in every different culture. So I think that's a good place to go to see that fleshed out. It, it's an appendix, not appendix, but the latter part of the abolition of man. Paul, you've you've gone on record before this conversation. I don't know if you knew where you're on the record. I'm saying that you don't read a lot of Lewis and Chesterton. Why is that? Uh, I got raked over the coals yeah, what's one wrong time. With you? Yes. Uh, I, their fiction. I love. 
the the essays, the nonfiction stuff I've read less of. Um, Tanya got on my case early on in this podcast. You go back to an early episode about mere Christianity and which I had read for her sake. And because for, she was saying that it really impacted her in college as she was trying to really formulate her ideas of the world. And, and I, and I think in that conversation, I kind of pointed towards like, like I grew up Catholic, right? Like the, the, the vision of the world, what I was, what I was supposed to believe, all of those things uh, made sense to me, but also were, um, were very clear to me. Right. And so I didn't have to, in some sense, I didn't have to make those decisions. So the arguments that C.S. Lewis is, it was arguing for to me just seems like, I mean, it's what I grew up as my bread and butter. And I feel like Chesterton's the same way. Like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, let me go back to Lewis, right. The Tao and, 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 but even Chesterton's arguments, they're all like, yeah, that's great. Like, I, you know, I agree with what you're saying. It's just not something that I go back to and read lots of because I totally, I mean, what they're saying, I feel like I'm in the choir and they're preaching to me. Yeah. You, you don't need, it doesn't stand out to you necessarily that they were defending the tradition because the tradition. I'm like, this is part of the tradition. This is, you know, it's wonderful. You don't feel as much of a felt need for it to be defended. That's right. That's right. Seems to me like at least a part of the resonance with G.K. Chesterton, for instance, is that, you know, heretics is just rolling through these different philosophers that are opposed to the tradition and him kind of just saying, this is why he's wrong. This is why he's wrong. This is why he's wrong. And the ideas those wrong philosophers are articulating are the ones that have won, won out, right? In, in kind of modern education. Do you think that's accurate? I would think so. I mean, I don't know one out, right? I mean, we're still around, um, you know, but the, that, yes, I mean, the, both of them were very, very clear. And I think that gives them a, a huge leg up and saying like, this is, this is why these things are important. And, and so the, the, I mean, Chesterton's, argument against certain philosophies really shows that he's fully, fully, fully in line with the tradition, right? He's not trying to make something new. He's okay with, and that's, that's, that's what's fascinating about both of them. They're like, uh, they're amazing thinkers, but they're completely content with being part of the tradition. Yeah. And this is, this is Chesterton's point at the beginning of orthodoxy <clears throat> which he writes after heretics because people said people challenged him said well you've you've told us all the things you disagree with what are the, what are the things you believe and and so he writes orthodoxy as a response to that and at the beginning of orthodoxy he tells the story of um, of an Englishman who goes on a journey to find new lands and comes up on the beach and plants his flag only to discover that, that, that in fact is England. <laughs> um, so that's what he's doing. He's, he's basically saying that because he's talking about his own spiritual journey and how, you know, he went off looking for the true religion and, and finally found it and planted his flag and realized it was historic Christianity. Um, yeah. And, and the interesting thing about uh, Chesterton and Lewis is that they're, they, they come from like different directions. Hmm. Um, because uh, Lewis, of course, was an Oxford professor, and he's yet he has this gift for speaking to the common man, and you see that in something mm-hmm. like uh, Mere Christianity. Chesterton, on the other hand, is just a journalist. He doesn't have any advanced degrees, and yet he's addressing these intellectual issues and influences Lewis. Um, he... Uh, Chesterton, you read Chesterton and you think, where did this guy come from? Because he's got this massive fund of knowledge and these, and these angles on issues that no one, no one is taking. He, he comes at something from a completely different direction. And it's so intellectually invigorating. And I think that was uh, his appeal to, to Lewis. They're two very different kind of people. Mm. And yet they, they, they kind of meet at this point this higher point um, uh, of, of historic Christianity and its importance to Western culture. For classical educators, are there other figures in this vein? Because when I think of defenders of the tradition closest to us, Lewis and Chesterton are the two that come to mind, right? Like Longfellow, 
is an American defender of the tradition in a sense. His poetry defends the tradition, but nobody, you know, quotes Longfellow or names their classical school after him. Lewis and Chesterton, they do because it seems like there's a polemical edge to their writing that works for our purposes today. Are, are there other authors or writers that you guys have been inspired by that are helpful for classical educators today as they are attempting to articulate the classical movement? Do they have to be proximate? No. The Apostle Paul. <laughs> sure. Uh, he's actually a very good one um, with his training and what he's able to do um, and the service he puts that towards. You know, that's a, I, I could, if I had an hour to think about that, I could write out a long list of people. And I'm going to feel bad because I'm going to think of all these people that I should have mentioned on the show that I'm, I'm, I'm going to forget. You know, you, you, you think you can call those people to mind. But you know what's interesting? Um, I'm going to sidestep Shane's question here, but I'm just started, th I'm thinking about the tradition, right? The classical tradition and people prior to the massive modern push. Because I'm thinking of um, Isocrates and, um, oh, this is embarrassing. Um, Aptonius, the Quintilian, right? All these folks that are making massive contributions to education. And at least from the our vantage point, it does not seem like they are actual, like, None of them are trying to undermine the tradition. All of them are trying to contribute to it. Whereas it seems like since Lewis's and Chesterton's day, we have people actively undermining and people actively fighting for it. And, and that's a fascinating, I think, circumstance that is, is particular to our day. Yeah. That's an interesting point because you got to wonder like a, a Dun Scotus is certainly interpreting, you know, Aquinas mm -hmm. and Augustine differently than people of his day, but it's all within the tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, and what's he, the difference between that and a, and a Dewey? Right. And even like uh, Descartes, right? Like what he does in philosophy is, I mean, he completely flips it on its head because of where he's going to start. But even at the end of his life, he is saying if what I did is, is not in line with the church and the tradition, I reject it. Right. But he's not able to pull back everything he wrote, you know, and, and stop that train. But he very much wanted to still be part of the tradition. Yeah, you know, it, it'd be a great thing to do like a show on that's one topic of, of who are the, who are the authors, maybe even writing now or, or over the last hundred years or so who who are who people who are doing classical education need to know and i just i started thinking of things as we were um one and for our people particularly i think um i think they all need to know peter kreeft mm. uh he's a philosopher from boston college and he um he is the great summarizer i don't know if that's that's really the right word he is he he is he is able to tell you about the, the different philosophers of history, what they thought in the most uh, in the most accessible way, and and he's and he he doesn't even though he's giving it in a very easy form, he's not degrading it. He's right. he's mm -hmm. giving it to right. you straight mm -hmm. in and, a certain sense. And Kreeft is spelled K R E E F T. Yeah. K R E E F T. Peter Kreeft. Um, uh, it, I, that's when I, when I, if I have um, like a, a young man who wants to learn philosophy, I point him straight at Kreeft mm. and I say, I say, read his Socrates meets series. Uh, you will learn more from that. And that's what you, because I, I didn't have anything like that when I started as a philosophy student. They started us in Aristotle's topics, yeah. which was just Awful. Sounds I mean, invigorating. Oh you know, yeah. I mean, it was in just all these in terms. The same I ways didn't of understand. like jumping in a frozen river is uh, invigorating. Uh, you know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and so, so I wished I had had somebody like Kraft, and mm -hmm. I Kraft primarily, and also in terms of modern philosophy, the books of William Barrett, mm -hmm. um, uh, the the death of the soul, um, and his book Irrational Man, which is a treatment of um, 
of existentialism and uh, in his book, Time of Need, which is the greatest book of literary criticism I think I've ever read and nobody knows about it. It's out of print. Um, but there's, there's each, you know, we all have mm-hmm. these intellectual heroes and, and I need more time to give a full list, but those are some of the ones uh, uh, Thomas Howard, who wrote Chance or the Dance, which mm-hmm. is one of my favorite books, uh, Philip Reef, um, who uh, was really talking a lot about Freud. He was one of the great interpreters of Freud, but he brings this sensibility to it and critic critique to it that is it, it, one of the great interpreters of modern thought. Uh, so I could go on with, with It someone. makes me think all of the guys that you've mentioned there are philosophers. And what's interesting about Lewis and Chesterton is that though they were philosophers to a sense, mm-hmm. I mean, Lewis wasn't to the same level as some mm-hmm. of these guys, they both wrote fiction. And, yeah. and I think that mm-hmm. that has kind of captured the movement at large because you can engage with Lewis and Chesterton without reading their philosophy. Right. You can be a fourth grader and start reading Lewis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not your, your normal fiction, though. That's right. That's <laughs> In right. either case. <laughs> no. Well, I think this has been a, a you've convinced me. We're doing fine. <laughs> we, we, should, we should continue using Lewis and Chesterton. Well, and I, let me point out when it, when it comes to fiction, right? I mean, there are modern fictional authors that are doing, that are in line with the tradition. They may never do any philosophy, but they're, they are intentionally, and you can explicitly see that they are trying to continue in the tradition with their fiction. Are you thinking of Graham Greene? Uh, that that <laughs> name did come to mind. Uh, there was another one that uh, now that is escaping me. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And there's a, you know, Graham Greene and Evelyn Waugh are doing something also strange. Yeah. Uh, and it's not, I mean, those are the, the types of authors you could tell somebody about. And if they're not somehow trained in reading, uh, non-evangelical literature or something, they'll come to those and, and it, it'll just stymie them. Mm. And they'll say, cause there's sin in there. There's, I mean, right. the, the truths are deeper in those books in Waugh and Green mm-hmm. than in a lot of the stuff that people are used to reading and they have to be prepared for it. Right. Right. The, like, uh, the short story author that we read that the name is eluding me, that uh, Southern author lady, who's uh, Flannery, Flannery, O'Connor. Flannery O'Connor, similar concept. Yeah. Certainly within the tradition, very mm-hmm. dark. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Another great example of that. Again, the, the truths are, are buried pretty deep there and you need to have the ability to dig those out and be able to analyze them. Otherwise you won't make any sense. You know, Viner O'Connor is the strangest writer. There's no other writer like her, but she's one of the great Christian writers. But this is why, this is why you spend, going back to Martin's comment, you spend your time reading those thousand good books, Mm -hmm. but you mean, but the older ones, because then you understand the tradition. And then when you're reading the modern ones, you can say, Oh, this person's in line with the tradition. This person's not. And you can start to see those patterns where in, in what you read. I don't think I've ever asked you to this question. Favorite Lewis book? I'll start by saying Miracles is my favorite. I think it's just a fascinating little essay. It's very compelling. I mean, not essay, It's it's but it's short. It's not very long. I think it's like 80 pages. And what he does there, it, yeah, it's just, it's, an, it's a fascinating takedown of, you know, the... Uh, naturalistic, you know, uh, epistemology and, and metaphysic. And that's yeah, great. I would have to say that first of all, where I am in my life now, I read fiction. I teach philosophy, but I read fiction. That's what I do. And so I, both of them, I'm going to go on the fiction side, but I really, it's, it, it, Lewis's space trilogy. Mm. I think, I mean, it, it's got a lot in yeah. there. And, and, but it, I think it fed me in a way that Narnia didn't. I read it when I was older and and I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think that Lewis is a better nonfiction writer than a fiction writer. And that's going to, uh, so I don't read a lot of his gonna, nonfiction. That's, that's, that's going to infuriate anybody with <laughs> all the Narnia fans out there. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I, I, sometimes I feel like saying miracles. Sometimes I feel like saying abolition of man. I just recently read that again because mm. that was our, the conference topic in the Netherlands. But gosh, mere Christianity is hard to beat. Yeah. I think as a as a as a piece of Christian polemics, I don't know if there's anything that is better. No, great. Well, I've enjoyed this conversation. It was more we, pleasant well, than I imagined. We didn't get to Chesterton. <laughs> we didn't get to Chesterton. 
Was your favorite Chesterton? What's your thing? favorite Chesterton? I thought you said you didn't read it. I was trying to leave you off the oh, hook. Oh no, no. I uh the very first Father Brown short story I think is just so wonderful hmm. because what tips Father Brown off Fa- Father Brown is traveling along with a, another person who claims to be a priest. And Father Brown is tipped off that this person is in fact not a priest and is in fact the robber that the police are looking for because in conversations they're having, this other guy who ends up being Flambeau is, uh, asserts that faith and reason do not go together. They are contradictory. And Father Brown says, and, and that that is his tip off, that this person is not part of the tradition. This person cannot be a cleric if this person is in fact putting those two things in opposition. And I just, I mean, it's those sorts of things in fiction that Is just delight me. Is the Blue Cross? Me. I think so. Yeah. I'll give him my favorite nonfiction in Chesterton book <laughs> and my favorite fiction in Chesterton <laughs> book. Uh, nonfiction is Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy oh. is the greatest book by the greatest thinker of the 20th century. Oh. And, um, Step aside, Graham Green. <laughs> <laughs> it's not nonfiction, right? I mean, we can, um, I can live with that. But my, my, my favorite fiction book of his, and I, uh, and now I, it, the Ball on the Cross, which is this, mm. this this book about faith and reason in in tension, is is my second favorite. My first favorite fiction of his is The Man Who Was Thursday. I think that is a transcendent book. Man Who Th- Was Thursday is my favorite as well. And that final scene when I, the character's name is Sunday, right? If I remember mm-hmm. correctly, he walks in and says, "Can you drink of the cup that I drink of?" And it's it's a critique of pantheism. That is at the, where he arrives finally in intellectually after moving through all these different intellectual pieces is that God's in everything. And then God says, if God's in everything, what about suffering? Like if, if you are God, could you give of your son and, and he die? Like only one God did that and he is not everything. And, I, and that's kind of what launches him in, into, into Christianity is realizing that it's only if there is a God distinct from everything else that is made that we can understand suffering um, and, and his love on the cross. And I love that. Yeah. I mean, and you have to realize also that basically everything Chesterton ever wrote was a first draft. Mm. He never edited everything. And I think about that book, the man who was Thursday. And I think that's a first draft. That's phenomenal. Now I mm-hmm. love the man who was Thursday, but I read it when I was probably in high school, early college and it it so stymied me that like when I've gone back and reread it, it's dense. I'm still like I don't know if it's just because like I'm still reading it through the first my first pass through lens or what, but I really like maybe that that'd be a fun thing to like sit down with and a few guys and read and book, work the way, through it. I teach I've taught this for many years is his introduction to his essay the in, introduction to the book of Job. <laughs> Because the problem of evil is very prevalent yep. in there too. That's right. I feel like I need to go read, but you told me that and I went and read that. And then I read the man who is Thursday. I'm still stymied. I feel like I need to read both of them like five times. The riddles of God. How's it go? The riddles of God are more something than the solutions of men. What is that? I'm missing a verb in there. Well, wow. oh, it's but that's what it is. He's got this great line that's the sort of the culmination of his. Um, oh, the riddles of God are more satisfying than the solutions of mm. men. Mm. I love that quote, and that's what Man Who Was Thursday is about. On that note, <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Classical Etc. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider liking this video. If you want to join the conversation, then you can comment below. And if you want to stay connected, please subscribe to our channel. I hope you enjoyed this show and we'll see you next time.